there, bee enthusiast. We're diving deep into a question you had about honeybees and winter. A question that really surprised me, actually. We often think about how bees huddle up to stay warm, right? But what about the air they're breathing inside that hive? Turns out it's way more important and interesting than I ever realized. It really is. And it actually challenges some of our basic assumptions about what animals need to thrive. Right. I mean, fresh air is good for everything. Right? Yeah. But these bees, they're actually creating an environment with way higher carbon dioxide levels than we'd find comfortable, like many times higher. And the research on this goes back decades. There's a 1997 study by Van Neram and Bulens that found bee clusters maintain these high CO2 levels all winter long across multiple colonies. It wasn't some fluke. It's intentional. Hold on. Are you saying the bees are actually manipulating the air inside the hive? I thought it was just a byproduct of them being in a confined space. That's what's so cool. They're not just tolerating these conditions. They're actively creating them, which begs the question why. Okay, so that's where my mind went to. It turns out there's a beekeeper up in the Yukon Etienne Tardif who's been monitoring CO2 levels in his hives. He's seeing similarly high numbers, just like those researchers back in 97. But here's the thing. Etienne's also noticed that when those CO2 levels get thrown off, maybe during a sudden warm spell, it actually stresses the bees out. They have to work harder to rebalance the air inside. His experience adds real-world weight to this idea that what's going on in the hive is more than just a passive process. These bees are environmental engineers. I love that environmental engineers. But how does this tie back to their winter survival? I'm still stuck on why they choose the stuffy CO2 rich air. Well, remember that 1997 study we mentioned? Yeah. It wasn't just measuring CO2. It was also looking at the bees' metabolic rates. Uh -huh. And this is where it gets really wild. Okay, I'm strapped in. Hit me with it. They found a direct link between those lower oxygen levels, which happen as CO2 goes up, and a slower metabolic rate in the bees. So you're telling me these bees have evolved a way to essentially slow down their metabolism and stretch out their winter food supply using CO2. That's incredible. It's like a superpower. By carefully managing the air they breathe, they're stretching those winter stores further than anyone thought possible. And remember how we talked about those vero mites being such a problem for bees? Well, there's a growing body of research suggesting that this whole CO2 strategy might actually help with that too. Wait, seriously, so not only does this help them conserve energy, but it might also be their secret weapon against those pesky mites. Tell me more. That's right. It seems counterintuitive, right? We think of needing fresh air to survive, but those mites, they seem to really struggle in this high CO2 environment. So the bees are basically engineering a hostile takeover of their own hive atmosphere, and it just so happens to be bad for the mites, too. That's wild. What kind of research are we talking about here? Well, there was a 2015 study by Bahraini and Curry that found increased mite mortality in hives that had restricted ventilation, which, of course, led to those higher CO2 levels. Hmm. And then more recently, in 2022, a study by Oniemi, Hopkins, and Shepard found significantly higher mite death in hives, kept at around 8.5% CO2 compared to those at more normal levels. Okay, that's a pretty big difference. It makes you wonder if beekeepers could use this information to their advantage, right? Could they adjust high ventilation in a way that helps the bees create this naturally hostile environment for the mites? Exactly. It's definitely an area with huge potential for more research. Could we find ways to manage CO2 levels that are safe and effective for the bees while also keeping those mite populations in check? It's a fascinating possibility. Speaking of fascinating, this whole thing with the bees going into that ultra-low metabolic rate, or ULMR, that just blows my mind. It's like they've discovered the secret to slowing down time itself. It really is remarkable. They're essentially hitting the pause button on winter. <laughs> In that state, they're totally still, their temperature drops, and they're using the bare minimum of energy. But the amazing thing is that it's completely reversible. Warm them back up to a certain temperature, and it's like nothing happened. They just pick up where they left off. It makes you appreciate just how much we still don't know about the natural world, doesn't it? And how much we can learn from these tiny creatures who've been perfecting these strategies for millennia. Absolutely. And it highlights how our assumptions about what's good or necessary for survival might not always line up with the ingenious solutions that nature's come up with. Yeah, it really makes you realize how much we still have to learn from the natural world. It does. And you know, it's funny, we often think about innovation as being all about technology and new inventions. But nature has been coming up with these incredibly elegant solutions for millions of years. It's true. Like, who would have thought that something as simple as the air bees breathe could hold the key to their survival? Right. It really challenges our assumptions. 
It does. And speaking of assumptions, this whole thing has made me rethink how we approach beekeeping. Oh, absolutely. Like, we talked about the potential for managing CO2 levels, but what about those more practical aspects? I'm thinking about what Etienne said about the importance of insulation, making sure those hives are well sealed so the bees can maintain that CO2-rich environment. Yeah, that's a great point. He actually found that too much ventilation could do more harm than good, especially during those shoulder seasons we were talking about, when the weather can't make up its mind. One day it's warm and sunny, the next it's freezing. Mm. Those fluctuations can really mess with the hive's equilibrium. It's like we're trying to fine tune this delicate ecosystem. Exactly. And a big part of that is understanding how something as simple as airflow can have these ripple effects. So it's not just about keeping them warm and dry, it's about creating the right conditions for these natural processes to work their magic. Absolutely. We have to work with the bees, not against them. Well, I gotta say, I'm feeling pretty inspired by these little environmental engineers. Me too, they're incredible. <laughs> We started with this question about how bees breathe, and we've uncovered all these fascinating adaptations and potential solutions. It's amazing what you can learn when you ask a simple question and really dive into the research. So to all you bee enthusiasts out there, the next time you see a honeybee buzzing around, take a moment to appreciate the ingenuity happening inside that tiny body. Who knows what other mysteries they're holding on to. Maybe we'll uncover some more of them together in our next deep dive. That's it for us today. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, happy beekeeping.